There you go. Okay. okay. So we're very happy to have Ryuichiro Kitano from KEK, a former collaborator and a very well-known physicist. And he's going to tell us about the strong CP problem and the axion on the lattice. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Um, it's always great to come back here. Um, today I'm going to talk about the, the lattice activity to try to understand the strong CP problem. And you know, know, my collaborators, including my next door lattice physicist and postdoc, who is also a lattice uh, expert and uh, my students involved. It's a relatively small group for lattice activity. They actually have a pointer, is that the one which I can? Yeah. <laughs> 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 I think that'll work. I think that's just. I think that's okay. Well, that that. okay. <laughs> that's also yeah. You can also use it to beat back questions. All right. So the. So let me start with the standard explanation of the strong CP program. So the, the standard model, you know, renormalizer, it's a renormalizer model, so the older renormalized interactions are there. It's not there, it's just renormalized to be there. So, so it's all there. But it seems that one exception is the, this one, this time. So that F mu nu is a group of field strings and uh, with funny contrast of contraction of the Lorentz indices, we get Lorentz invariant term, but that actually is breaks CP and E. Uh, symmetry. So the, the state that um, which is perfectly gauge invariant, Lorentz invariant, even dimension 4 operator, that uh, actually can be written down in the Lagrangian, but uh, breaks CP. So there's an upper bound on this parameter that it turns out to be 10 to the minus 10 or so. It's very small. It needs to be very small. That's the strong CP problem. So the we don't know the reason why this why this parameter is so small? So, so that's the strong CP problem. So maybe something big is hiding behind this one. So that's the motivation to think about this problem. Now let me explain a little bit more about the strong CP problem to, to understand what I'm doing. So the, okay, so the QCD is defined in this way. So this is a quantum way of defining QCD. So QCD partition function. It's just the integration of our exponential minus action. You know, those are the gauge fields and fermions uh, integrated out. So the uh, QCD Lagrange or, or action is given like this, and this is the field strengths, uh, the kinetic term for gluons and the FFT are included, and these are the fermion uh, kinetic term. So this is the standard way to define QCD. All right, and uh, of course, you know, we integrate over as a space as not the fields, so, so the, the partition functions are function of G or theta or N. You know, those are the arguments of the function. Right. And as I said, you know, theta breaks C P and uh, that was uh, actually noticed by the proof. And uh, the how much is the breaking is, is actually calculated in seventy nine by those famous people. And uh, it turns out that the neutron EDM coming from this theta term is 10 to the minus 15 uh, theta E centimeter. That means, you know, uh, and compared with the experimental upper bound, theta is 10 to the minus 10, or less than 10 to the minus 10. So the, the way to calculate is to, actually under the, uh, well, if you have non zero theta term, we have CP violating interaction between nuclear and nuclear pion appears. Usually we have gamma five sandwich, but uh, with theta we have you know, no gamma five interactions there, and uh, that gives you a neutron EDM at the one level. So this is, is a way to uh, calculate the neutron EDM. Okay. So the but the this is a unusual term in the Lagrangian somehow because this is actually purely quantum level. That, that I mean, um, if you 
just write down the equation of motion out of this action. Just minimize this action by using the uh, field. You don't get I know this stuff because if you you know take a derivative with respect to the gluon, this term actually vanishes. The reason is that the integration of a FF dual with this coefficient gives you integer number if the action is finite. Yeah, if this is finite, this integration is finite, this is an integer. So this is a very amazing <laughs> mathematical fact that uh, we actually get an integer number if you integrate over FF dual. It's not necessary to be the solution of equation of motion. Let's just put a random field in a configuration. Put it here, you get the integer number. I didn't believe it when I was a student, but it was true. <laughs> it's actually true. <laughs> You're a good student. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so, the, so the, it, it didn't appear in the equation of motion. That means it, it can only be physical when you think about the quantum mechanical you know, question. So it's really, you know, you have to ask if, if this theta term is really physical. You know what kind of physical quantity you can you can see this effect. So the the, the question we can now ask is that if partition function z depends on theta or not, right? Because you know as I said, classical level it doesn't appear, but the quantum level this is the uh, most important function in the quantum level. And if this depends on theta, all the correlation function depend on theta, because you know correlation function can be by just differentiating this one. So the, if theta, z depends on theta, everything depends on theta, so that's physical. So that you can check. Just, just taking a derivative of theta, a derivative of z is, 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 is theta, and just choose at theta equals to zero point, what you get is zero. So that this is something not very interesting, because this is coming from the fact that the theory is CP invariant. So at theta equal to zero point, there's no term which breaks CP. So the theory is CP invariant. But uh, if you take one derivative, it becomes CP odd. Right? So CP odd quantity in CP invariant series is most likely zero. And if there is a CP, spontaneous CP variation, it can be non-zero, but uh, we know that in QCD vacuum, that kind of thing didn't happen. So the, this is actually just, just zero. So first derivative is zero. But uh, what's interesting to remember is that uh, this thing actually gives you, uh, OK, because it's theta derivative. That means from the expo exponent, we get this factor falls off. So this gives you a definition of this uh, expectation value of f dual, which I said, this is integer. So it gives you. Uh, uh, expectation value of this n integer. And this integer is called topological charge or instant of number uh, in the community. <laughs> this is just topological. It is actually topological, so topological charge. The most important quantity, like most fundamental quantity in this kind of question is actually the second derivative. So if you take the second derivative, that's, a, that's the expectation value of q squared rather than q because we take second two derivatives. So the, it's an expectation value of Q squared divided by the volume, well, to, to make it actually finite. So, so, the, so this is the most fundamental quantity. It's called topological susceptibility. So it, it's, it's a, you know, a, well, this is anyway the definition. So this is the most important quantity and if this chi t is non-zero, that means z depends on theta, right? Because it's derivative. So if chi t is non-zero, that means theta is physical. So this is something which you, I mean, this is it's really telling us that the theta is physical, or not even at theta equal to zero. Uh, no, no. Not even, I mean, yeah, just changing the theta at near theta equal to zero gives you physical effects or not, that you can see. So, so yeah, so this is the most fundamental point. I'm going to just measure this one on the lattice data. 
But anyway, let, let me say a little bit more. So the Q is the instant of number. So let's imagine you do the path integral. Path integral is from the past to future. You, you just uh, think of some configuration. And the path integral, you, you put the, you know, this, uh, this factor as a probability. You know, this, with this way, we just generate all the uh, path integral. And for each path, you can actually find an integer number, Q. For, for each path, you have field configuration of gluons, and you calculate this quantity. Because we, we have path to future everywhere, you have numbers, so you can actually calculate. And for sure, this is an integer number, as I said. So we can actually make a histogram of that. Do the path integral. And one, this path integral, you get one, then it's just one box here. And so so you, you can make a histogram of that. So Q squared is that the expectation value of Q squared means this is just a standard deviation of this histogram. So this is the uh, quantity which we want to measure. But we, we need to actually put QCD in a box, finite size box, to do this thing. Because the relation says that this chi t for the large you know, volume scaling, we can see that this is actually a finite quantity. That means Q squared goes to infinity when, you, when your box size goes to infinity. That means you know, this, this goes to flat. But uh, so the question is that you, you have to first put the QCD in a finite box and do this simulation and just measure the standard deviation. And later we, we just the, uh, divide by the, the volume size. And usually we, we change the volume size and, and, and make, to make sure this one is independent of volume. So that's the way to, to actually measure this kind of thing. But anyway, it is clear that from, from this picture you can actually really measure the NKIT. So the KIT really measures how often, for instance, an appear in the path integral. That means if KIT is zero, you always get zero configuration. The non-trivial topology configuration doesn't appear if KIT is zero because the standard relation is zero. Right. So, so the, if this is non-zero, as I said, theta is physical. So if you find one instant of configuration anyway, then it for sure theta is physical. So this is a quantum level question. And one more important thing is that the chi t is pretty much related to the clock mass. I didn't uh, say much about that, but uh, here, actually the QCD partition function can be written down in a different way, two different ways. One is the, the original one, what? I already explained. And the second way is just to eliminate this term. The theta term is eliminated, but that gives you some funny phase factor here in the cold mass. So this is coming from the uh, anomaly. We can actually rotate away this uh, some phase, but that rotation gives you this factor as a Jacobian of this integration uh, variable. So the, this theory and this theory, because we integrate out any, <laughs> all the fields, you know, whatever the measure you take, you, it's fine, it's the same. But uh, the superficial feature of you know, this Lagrangian level is it's different. But uh, it's for sure that this function is the same if you use this one or this one. Okay, so, so now, we can actually calculate chi t, topological susceptibility, just a second derivative, by using this action rather than this action. That must be the same, again. And if you do that, you actually get this uh, completely different uh, description. You know, before it was just Q squared expectation value, but uh, now it's uh, actually one point function of uh, APCO condensation times APCO. That, that is coming from here. So, so we can actually put this phase in any flavors, like up coke, down coke, top coke, or whatever. So let, let's just put to the up coke. Then you know you have up coke, up coke, up coke. So take a second day, but then you get this one, one point function of up coke. And there's also because it's second day, but you have also get you also get a two point function. You know 
this one and this one here, you know, this one point function is in acting theta here, it drops off this one and acting again, that, that drops thing. That gives you one point function. Two point function is acting this one and this one twice. That gives you u bar, u, u bar gamma phi with u two point function. That you get. But that is up for mass to the square power. The two point function is mediated by the, the pi on. So the, you know, it is suppressed by up quark mass squared over pi on mass squared. If you take down quark as a, the one which get the phase, you get the same expression. But if you put down quark here, this term and this term has the same order. So, so that just cancels. But anyway, <laughs> wherever you get, you get the same result. You get the rightest quark condensation. That's what you get. The lightest quark mass times the lightest quark condensation. And uh, so here it's interesting. U by U condensation is for sure it's non-zero. Because we know that chiral symmetry is broken spontaneously. That's why that's why pi one appeared in our one. So that means this is non-zero. That we know for sure. That means up quark is non-zero, theta is always physical. So that's the thing we need to check. Up quark is non-zero, it's theta is always physical. And if up quark is zero, it just this one vanishes. So up quark mass is zero, physics doesn't depend on theta. So it is really related to the question of up quark mass. So this is uh, clear. Okay. And you can look for what's the value of up quark by looking at the particle data group, look, and uh, look at the up quark mass um, page, and you can find that the, it's 2.3 MeV, like minus 5, 0.5, so like 4 point something sigma away from zero. So it's probably not zero. But what's actually interesting is that the line, one line below, it's 2.15 MeV plus or minus, you know, this. Point one, so it's like 21 sigma away, 20 sigma away from zero. And so, th so this really says, you know, PDG group is so conservative about this up quark mass. And the, the, why this is conservative is actually written here. The, the estimates of B and U masses are not without controversy and remain under active investigation. And within the literature, there are even suggestions that U quark could be essentially massive. So, you know, we are confused. <laughs> we are confused. We don't know. We don't know what's the theoretical situation, but so somehow they need to quote a number, so that's why I think they, they put a large uncertainty somehow. But anyway, so that, this is the uh, uh, confusion about up quark. I mean, I, I'm going to explain a little bit more about the confusion. But anyway, really, the, if you ask somebody, What's the up quark mass and the, and depending on who you ask, you get a different result. Most of the people say it's just around two MeV and probably not massless. But if you ask this, you know, lattice people, it's 10, 20 sigma away. And if you ask chiral perturbation people, it's like four sigma away. <laughs> you know, so, so it's a bit confusing situation. But probably not zero. That's the consensus. Now let me confuse you a little bit about the quark mass. Uh, so the confusion actually appeared from the discussion of George and MacArthur 81, and this paper actually have never published. I think there was a fight with the uh, baby, probably. But anyway, so, so the, what they said is the following. Okay, we can, we know that uh, uh, there's an instanton, in a semi-classical instanton picture in QCD. So instant is some non part of our group. Sorry, I don't know. That. Some field configuration. And uh, with this instant on, to show that uh, the, uh, there's an effective interaction appears with all the clocks attached to it. So this is the uh, picture for the proof vertex. So this, this actually breaks the chiral symmetry. So that's the uh, interesting point. And if you actually close the loop by using the mass term, 
twenty fourth mass down here and down fourth mass down to here. What you get is up fourth mass down by instant. So this means, you know, this discussion says there is actually an additive shift of this order to the quark mass. So if you start with quark mass equal to zero, which makes sure that uh, uh, the topological susceptibility is zero, because if you put Lagrangian parameter zero, we, we, we derive that the chi t is zero, so theta is unpredictable, but still you may get the quark mass, effective quark mass through this uh, picture. So that's, and they calculated what's the size of that, and, and depending on how you calculate, you, you kind of get MEV value. And PDG central value was 2 MEV, so it's not too bad. And actually, it's good, you know. So it may be true that the Lagrangian parameter is zero, and so, you know, strong CP problem is just absent, because it's unphysical. But still, up-scope measurement may be may given you an MEV value because of the instant effect. So this is the argument by these uh, people. And this may be true or not, that's a confused argument. What's confusing is that you have to define what you are calculating. So that, <laughs> this is the point which is very annoying, you know. If you are doing, uh, yeah, first of all, quark mass is something you cannot measure directly because quark is confined. So, so something you can't, it, there are many definitions of quark mass can do. Without specifying what you're calculating, this is a meaningless you know, discussion. So that's one of the uh, points, I think, uh, which is confusing. So now you have to ask, what is this mass? And, and so on. But, but anyway, let me confuse you again. And there's another related confusion that is by Kaplan and Manhai, this, this is actually not a confusion, this is a fact about the chiral perturbation theory. So the chiral perturbation theory, that is just an effective theory for pions. You want to understand the, the behavior of pions. And pion, we know that, that those are the, the uh, Goldstone bosons associated with chiral symmetry. So that's the only principle of the chiral perturbation. We just rely on chiral symmetry. And now, in the chiral perturbation theory, we have a parameter called the mass, quark mass. Even though there's no quark in the picture, but the quark mass, this is something which parameterizes the breaking of chiral symmetry explicitly. So this is, you know, of course, it's, it's cut, it, it transforms under SU3 times SU3, and 3 comma 3 under SU3 times SU3. That means, you know, it's a, it's a three by three matrix, and because you put some number here, so it's like expressed breaking of chiral symmetry. So those are the parameters in the Lagrangian, chiral Lagrangian. But as I said, chiral symmetry is the only principle for the for the for, for this chiral Lagrangian. If you have something which have the same quantum number, you can't distinguish it. So so the, for example, actually they could. Uh, form a 3 comma 3 representation out of this one. So this is DS, SU, UD, some funny you know, combination. This is actually a core factor of this one. And this actually transforms completely the same as this one. So the Lagrangian parameter, which you call the quark mass, may not be that quark mass <laughs> in the Lagrangian. I mean, okay, in the QCD, it's for sure that quark mass is the only one which breaks chiral symmetry, uh, uh, except for QED effect, right? So, so this is the quark mass. But, but uh, if you have different set of parameters which actually gives you the same quantum number, you can't distinguish from this one and this one. In, the, in other words, what do you call quark mass may be different from the quark mass in the, in the real QCD. For example, this, this matrix plus coefficient times this matrix can be equally called the quark mass because that transforms in the same uh, way. So, M up, maybe M up, what you get from the chiral Lagrangian, maybe M up plus this effect. And this is something related to this one because it's the same effect. M up, 
plus this one, maybe the quote. So the, this really says that uh, there's a redundancy. Just looking at the chiral Lagrangian the physical quantity and compare, you can't get copies in principle <laughs> because you know you can't distinguish this one and this one. Right. So so the, you you really need to 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 work at Q, work in QCD. What not the effective Lagrangian. The effective Lagrangian can't tell you what's the definition of quark mass. So the, the zero quark mass is redundant because we have we can just mix those two. So so the, that makes us you know doing the lattice simulation to understand what's the size of what's the quark mass. It's zero or non-zero. So the, but the lattice is still have a difficulty. Lattice action has quark mass. Lattice is just doing the buffer integral on the computer. But uh, lattice action has quark mass and up quark mass, down quark mass as a parameter in the Lagrangian. So that's good. You can check if that is, if, if that is zero or non-zero by just comparing with the physical quantity like metal spectrum. So that usually, uh, that, that's possible. So the, but the, the quick problem is that lattice actually breaks chiral symmetry. Um, so the, uh, you know, most of the lattice simulation. So the, if you think about this as the up quark mass on the lattice, so you have a lattice up quark mass parameter and down quark mass parameter. And if you put zero quark mass up and down both, you actually don't get pi of the massless pi on because you break chiral symmetry by discretizing the space. So the what you, what you usually get is this picture. So you, you get pi on massless pi on at some point at some quark mass, finite quark mass and down quark mass. There we define this is the point where we you know quark is massless. That is very reasonable. That this is the physical uh, argument. Because up quark and down quark are both massless, we know that pi is massless. So this point corresponds to that to the massless point. So this is for sure. It is fine. So so let's assume that we have you know correct meson spectrum here. So now we are asking what's the quark mass? What's the up quark? But here we need to somehow define again the quark mass. It may be the distance from here to here that, that sounds reasonable, right? And down quark mass is distance from here to here that sounds reasonable. But that's basically, uh, but I, I'm oversimplifying each one, but that's kind of the basic thing what a lot of people do. We somehow define the quark mass and uh, and uh, look at the, the physical quantity. But the real question which we are interested in is chi t is zero or not? So this is the physical quantity again. Uh, this is physical quantity. So we can measure. So it's really the question is, OK, if the chi t is zero line defines the quark mass, up quark mass equal to zero line, right? Because up quark mass is zero. You know, chi t is zero. That's the, the physical statement. You know, it's, that's the definition. That should be the definition of the quark mass. Is quark mass. So the question is really this line. Okay, line goes through this one is is guaranteed because massless pi and point is again you know quark mass equal to zero point. So so the, if line goes to like this or line goes through the physical point. So these are the really the question. If you know chi t zero line goes to the physical point, which means up quark is massless. So, you know, this is really the physical physical point is, is identified from the physics, like meson spectrum. And this is the physical point. So it, this is really the physical quantity versus physical quantity you know, relation. So this is the question which is well defined and we should check. And I would say there's no other check we can do because 
upscope, massless upscope is only defined through the topology. You know, that, that's the definition. Because otherwise, we, you get, you know, you, you get the active collection. So I would say, if you are doing lattice simulation, and if your lattice breaks chiral symmetry, then there's no guarantee that the word identity is whole. So, so, so the only thing we can do is to compare the physical quantity versus physical quantity and get some result. So I would say this is the only way to check if upscope is massless or not. Now you said there, there, there is another argument. I don't think it's a very strong argument, but it's maybe worth mentioning, and that is uh, the, the chiral perturbation theory. Uh, some chiral perturbation theory people would tell you that, you know, that if you look at, you, you need MDMS to give you the uh, measured value of the up quark mass. Mm -hmm. And what they would claim is that, in fact, the strange quark mass is too small. So the point is that somehow you couldn't explain the success of chiral, strange mm -hmm. chiral perturbation theory. So that is an argument that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I personally don't believe it, but I uh, just think okay. you, might, you might want to be aware that that argument does exist. So after, yeah, yeah. after the Kaplan Manohar paper came out, Lloyd mm -hmm. Weiler and people like this uh -huh. tried to make this argument. Right, yeah. But actually, yeah, Ruth Weiler is... Well, Rootwire is kind of on, on <laughs> okay, Rootwire actually, oh, okay, so this ambiguity is called Kantra Manoha ambiguity, and that ambiguity means that you have up quark and up, you know, that the up quark down quark mass has an ambiguity on the ellipse of some elliptic curve right. you can draw, and that is somehow called Rootwire ellipse. <laughs> he knows everything about it. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and of course, it is probably unlikely that uh, strange folk is not you know, high enough to mimic that. I mean, like, for example, I mean, we don't live in this world at all, but suppose mm -hmm. that the up, down, and strange quark masses were approximately equal, mm -hmm. right? Then this would not work. Right, yeah. because this this correction would be small. Otherwise, right. Carl, and and they're making some version of that argument. Of course, it's yeah, much yeah. more complicated because the strange quark mass is large, and mm -hmm. that's why I don't believe it. But I mean, that yeah. that is an argument that you can try to make. Right, but that's right. But uh, you know, if this is really twenty sigma or not, if really you can. Believe in this systematic uncertainty. <laughs> you know, right? yeah, no, I, I, totally, and, I totally agree. And that is really related to the question of how you define the quark mass, I would say. So that's something I should really look at. Believing in, you know, hoping that you know, we may be in the up quark masses world. <laughs> but anyway, but this is very preliminary result. Uh, you don't get any result, you know, physical meaning, meaningful result out of this picture, but just saying I'm working on it. So, but anyway, I'm, what I'm trying is to just calculate the, the, the topological susceptibility as a function of quark mass, which people usually define. People define quark mass through PCAC relation. That is a kind of word identity. But word identity is not, you know, guaranteed in the, in, on the lattice. So this is just one definition of the quark mass, right? And uh, but anyway, so, so this is the bare mass of the, and, I mean, Lagrangian mass per beta in relation to the PCAC mass you can get, and uh, by PCAC mass, the polar susceptibility. So, so the, the question is whether this line crosses zero or not. So, but we have, before going to that, we have many uncertainty on the how to define the, the topological charge on that kind of thing. So uh, you can't get any, any result from out of this. But what I want to say is that if the line goes like this, you have large additive shift. And if it goes like this, you, you have large additive shift. So the, anyway, the, the topology susceptibility zero line, zero point, whether or not this crosses this zero point or not, that's the uh, fundamental question you want to raise. And here, to do that, we don't have to 
you know, do the simulation on the physical point. We are actually making down fork and strange fork really heavy, so that uh, if there is an active shift, there must be a larger effect. You know, as I said, you know, the, the active mass shift is down fork times, down fork mass times strange fork mass. If both are heavy, it must give you a large, you know, shift. So that should be visible in a, uh, if you go to the continuum limit. So this is still uh, not, not just a bare this thing. So we have to read it. We, we have to uh, measure on a lots of lattice, and you have to take continuum limits so that to, to get an uh, interesting result. But anyway, so uh, this is something. Is, is it, is it, are you going to discuss about how you define the topological susceptibility on the lattice? Or? Yeah, yeah, later I, I, I okay. explain a little bit. Yeah, there are actually uncertainty. Well, this is, you know, crazy uncertainty. <laughs> you know, these are actually different ways of defining topological susceptibility on the lattice, like topological charge on the lattice. Yeah, there are huge uncertainty. So that uh, is something I need to attack. So, but before, uh, and, and uh, so this is was the primary, my primary interest. But but as a cyborg, actually. I could do something about the axion business. So that's something I can explain a little bit. So the axion is motivated by solving the strong CP problem under the assumption that upcoke is ma not massless. You know, if upcoke is massive, then theta is really physical. So we have to somehow solve the problem by some clever way. So this is actually a very clever way. That, that is to promote the theta term to, to a field. So theta now becomes a field, just, just throwing axion to the, to the QCD and couple FF dual to this axion. So this is the, the definition of theory, QCD plus <coughs> this one, and also kinetic term for this guy, axion. So as I said, you know, effective action of QCD, because second derivative was high T, so by definition, you, you get this term uh, as an effective, uh, effective Lagrange. And we now promote this theta to theta plus A, so we can, the effective action for axion is really just in you know, axion kinetic term and this term, because theta is now replaced by theta plus A, or, or, or F is a decay constant. So we can now see that the, actually the, this high T is is related to the axial mass in a one-to-one -one corresponding way. It, it's just really the axial mass squared. FA is just the k constant, which is the only parameter we, we throw in. So this is the parameter. So the axial mass is this one. But how, and, and actually, this pi t is positive, actually positive definite, because it was, uh, you know, you can see from here, it's positive definite. That means uh, at, at theta for zero. So, so the, uh, uh, this is, I mean, the Euclidean space, so that's why this is plus. But anyway, so, so the, because it's positive, the minimum of the potential gives you this combination to be zero. So that's the uh, beautiful way to solve the strong CP problem, because this is zero. The effective theta term is just zero, and that's a dynamically chosen. So this is the way to solve the strong CP problem. Just throw in action, action, that, that's it. And uh, this high T is now uh, uh, axial mass. Yeah, I'm actually making a joke for you, but the Chichi Queen paper appeared 77. That is actually before the calculation of, you know, neutron in here. So the solution appeared first earlier than the problem, so <laughs> <It's> interesting. <laughs> so they knew that it's a problem <laughs> before calculating. <laughs> so when you, so, so that's the situation. And the axiom not only solves the strong <coughs> CP problem, they can be a dark matter of the universe. So, so the, uh, the standard mechanism is called the misalignment mechanism. That is, OK, after the inflation, the, the universe is hot. At that time, action doesn't have a potential. But as the universe cools down, 
axion gets a potential and axion starts to oscillate and this oscillation is an energy density and that behaves as a matter energy density so that can be a dark matter of the universe so the, how, the, the way to calculate the axion abundance now is very easy because this quantity is known to be time independent that means you can estimate this one uh, at the time of oscillation. That when oscillation starts, uh, this quantity, uh, you know, oscillation, beginning of the oscillation to now, this quantity is invariant. So we can just estimate this one at the time where the axion starts to oscillate. And the axion starts to oscillate when axion masses becomes comparable to the, to the Hubble friction. Hubble friction, this one. So, so the, if axial mass is, is comparable to this, this term, you know, axial field, the potential one starts to oscillate. So, so this is the uh, standard way to calculate. Then once you know the axial mass at the time of the, you know, when this equation holds, then the, the, this com combination is just, you know, axial mass times the displacement with the distance from here to here, and the axial, the temperature field, so that's it. So, so the that's the so the only thing we need to know is this one. SA is a theory parameter, so we cannot we don't know, but uh, MA is something we need to calculate. So if what's the temperature dependence of the axiom mass? That's the essential input to calculate the axiom abundance now. So that's very important. And as I said, axiom mass is just chi g. So we what we need to is just to calculate chi t as a function of temperature. That we can easily do. And but the usual way to calculate this is not the lattice. Usually what people use is the instanton calculus. The instanton calculus is very tricky, but it's basically just a, a dimensional counting. Instanton effect always comes with lambda kc to the beta function power. So that's it. And at, it's known that uh, we, we already explained that chi t vanishes in a clock mass to zero. <coughs> that means that this always comes with a product of clock mass. Right. It's not true at the zero temperature, actually, but uh, at the high temperature, it's true. And so, so the just dimensional analysis, we need t to the minus a for the free, free free vacuum C. So this is actually enough. We don't have to know all the detail about this one. I mean, this is almost enough to, to, to get the uh, 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 rough, almost correct uh, result of the axiom of us. So just plugging this one into this formula. We know that half of this t square over prime. So, so the just, just equating and solving, you get the, uh, uh, if axiom mass is around this, you know, the starting temperature is like one GB and the axiom of us now, can be a dark matter when the uh, so mass is like, you know, me, micro electron or 10 micro electrons. So this funny power is coming from this t to the minus 8. So this is the uh, standard way to calculate the instant uh, axiom about us now, uh, you know, this back in the 80s or 70s. Is, is, the, is the typical instanton size set by the temperature? Yes. Yeah, there's a discussion of if this is g times temperature, g squared times temperature, or the, you know, okay, those kind of things. But, but it's uh, not basically temperature. Yeah, the, the whole kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And 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 one GeV, the fact that that's close to the QCD scale, yeah, that is that just a numerical right? coincidence? Yeah. It's just that for the axion masses that I care about, that really is the number that comes yes. out, and it's just a coincidence. Yeah. Well, well, basically, I mean, it's a very steep function, so everything becomes, uh, everything happens near the QCD phase transition, so it's not that accident. Right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. Yeah, but if, yeah, it can be 10 GB. <laughs> but it is worried, because ten, 1 GB, okay, so, so the instant point is basically a perturbation theory. It sounds like no perturbative, but it's a perturbation theory. The perturbation from the non non-perturbative yeah, solution. So, so the one GeV is strongly coupled. So uh, we don't know what, how this is reliable or not. 
before doing the lattice combination. And uh, okay, so the so the dark matter can be okay. So axial mass is the only parameter in the Lagrangians because one of i a is the only parameter. So this is something we can calculate once you specify the model. So this is the prediction of QCD. Uh, this is photon coupling in this case. So there are experiments which actually you know, try to draw this region. Probably in the future you can find it if axiom is true. But uh, the question is that this instant on character is correct or not, which is very essential to draw, uh, well, draw this line is fine, but uh, to, to, to specify what, where is the interesting range of the axiom mass. So the Witten told us that actually instant doesn't make sense in QCD. Uh, it says instant gas to disappear in QCD because it doesn't match to like 1 over n expansion. And, uh, but uh, Affleck says that the, no, it, it actually makes sense at high temperature. So it, it, it should, instant analysis is correct <coughs> where it should be, but not the expert. So, so the, the Witten's claim is at the zero temperature. So zero temperature, it doesn't work. Most, many people agree. But at finite temperature, it agrees because it's weak coupling. But it's not weak coupling, one GB. So, so it's really important if uh, instant on calculation makes sense or not. But even more, actually, Cohen and, uh, and also Japanese group said that the actually instant on uh, estimate is just totally wrong. It's based, based on this word identity, they claim that the uh, chi t is clock mass to the fourth power for the two flavor QCD. As I said, you know, instant on estimation is m to the nth power, so that means for two flavor case, it's m squared must be. But the uh, Analysis based on all identity under some assumption, but uh, uh, they they found that this is m q to the fourth power, and even these people claim that height is just zero, m q to the infinity power, at one, with finite cold mass. So this is clearly inconsistent with a uh, instant picture. We don't know uh, if this is correct, but uh, but anyway, there are people who argue that uh, instant maybe just doesn't make sense. So I just did some experiment that, OK, people say that this is power law. IT as a function is a power law. But if this is not power law, it's, it's actually shut, suddenly shut down what happens to the axiom. It's actually very really interesting. Uh, axiom abundance is, gets enhanced by the uh, factor which parameterizes how quickly it shuts off. So actually, based on if this is really, you know, step function, I get omega to be 10 to the 5, independent of the axiom mass. So the axiom window, so-called axiom window, is just gone. So the, it's very important how quickly, you know, chi t shuts off as a function of temperature. That, that is very important because, you know, if it uh, potential grows really quickly, the, there's a, a, a non-adiabatic you know, effect. So the axiom has a huge amplitude from the beginning. Usually, it's, it's gradually you know, you know, gets a potential. So it's, it's you know, adiabatic. So it's not that large enhancement. But if it's really quick, we get a large enhancement. Uh, so, it, 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 so it seems that lattice determination of chi t as a function of temperature is important. So that's something uh, I worked on. Uh, so, the, so the question of how do you uh, calculate topological charge on the lattice? So that is a little bit tricky because Q, as I said, should be an integer for each configuration. But if you do this integral on the lattice, that is just summation because it's fine size you likely get non-integer number <laughs> depending on how you define this f. 
So if the definition of FF dual on the lattice is not unique, so it's 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 actually uh, ambiguous. But uh, it's interesting that uh, this number is related to a trace of gamma five, and you know where did students may think that tra trace of gamma five should be zero, but if it's a big trace, it, it can be non-zero. Big trace means trace over all the space. And then you get the infinity. Infinite times zero. And that can be fine and actually integer. So this actually measures the, the zero mode of Dirac operator. And uh, because it's zero number of Dirac, you know, zero mode, that's for sure it's integer. So the we can actually use this definition as a topological charge. That gives you an ambiguous uh, measure for, uh, way to, to define the, the topological charge. Oh, but anyway, there are two ways, bosonic way and fermionic way somehow, so two ways. So bosonic way, as I said, this is usually non-integer you get, but there are techniques to, to get the integer number by using a Wilson flow or gradient flow. So that, it's basically artificially making the configuration smooth. And after the gradient flow, you get actually an integer number. So that's the uh, nice way to define the uh, instance number. And as I said, the fermionic, just, just you know, counting the number of zero mode, that's also a nice definition of uh, instance number. And that's something we can do. And that is made possible by the discovery of gamma 5 on the lattice. So gamma 5 on the lattice is quite uh, difficult, because if you just naively define gamma 5, it's always 0. I mean, the trace is always 0, because it's really a finite uh, sum, finite matrix, so it's just 0. But uh, you can see nice, there's a nice definition of gamma 5 that makes uh, index theorem correct. So that's called overlap Dirac operator. But anyway, that, by using that, you can get the ambiguous. Uh, Sorry, but somehow this is all predicated on the idea that I mean, uh, uh, I mean, why why should you believe that finite action configurations are somehow uh, the right way to think about the the fully quantum path integral? Is that obvious? I mean, if the action is not finite, then there's no reason why Q should be an integer. Actually, it's not finite; it just doesn't contribute. Really? Yeah. The how do I know that? I mean, how do I know there aren't just many, many more configurations with infinite action? Ah. Uh, I agree. If I have a saddle, then uh -huh. you know, right? But if you don't have a saddle, if you're far from any saddle, I don't think, I don't see why you know that finite action dominates. Ah, you're asking two difficult questions to me. <laughs> okay, so the, it's I think the belief that the QCD is defined. <laughs> okay, and uh, once QCD is defined, the, the must be, you know, in this way, the infinite action shouldn't contribute to, to the path. On the line, there's no infinite action. But so, Q is also not an integer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But but uh, that's you know well if you be, if it define this way it's an integer. Mm -hmm. If you, I mean this is coming from the fact that you have order a uncertainty in the definition, so it's been believed that uh, in the continuum limit it must be an integer. But uh, well that's it. <laughs> Yeah, there are subtlety in the definition of the topological charge, but that's why I like this one because this is somewhat, uh, I mean, guarantee that in the continuum limit index theorem should work. But, right, so, so, the, so this is uh, must be the definition. So, so the okay, so the there are three groups who did the same calculation. This is the quench QCD, so it does no close. But uh, as a function of temperature, you can calculate the basically the axiom squared, and uh, so we get uh, a straight line in the long throat. 
that means uh, log log plot. That means it's a power log. So, and power is like R minus six or so. So this is still clinched, but the instant contradiction is t to the minus seven. So it's not that bad, I would say. Uh, this is not that high temperature. Here we have, you know, TC is the critical temperature, so it's still like twice or four, so, or four times the uh, critical temperature, but still we can actually get a nice uh, power of the here. And, uh, okay, but this is Yamin theory, it does not go here. And the clock is the total point. So this, this is just an exercise. But, but already at this point, I'm so uh, surprised that the instant transform so good, even at very low temperature. We have some already a power law behavior. We could see with the power not that different from the, the, the naive prediction. And uh, there are many papers that have appeared, uh, including the quote mass. And this is the uh, uh, Italian group in 2015, and uh, this says that, okay, the same product, that the uh, temperature to the chi d, and they say that there's a power law, but power is completely different from the instant on estimate, t to the minus three or so, and instant on estimate is t to the minus eight. So it's so different. So maybe something wrong with instant on or lattice or both. And, uh, okay, so maybe I <laughs> spent too much time. But anyway, so, so lattice has a technical difficulty in, uh, in calculating because if you go high temperature, that means high P becomes small, that means you only get the uh, un you know, uninteresting Q equal to zero configuration. We want to measure the Q square uh, expectation value, but if you get Q equal to zero, that's just a waste of time. Right? So, so then I, I change the strategy and I try to get the exponent directly. And the exponent you can actually get from the difference of the action for each topological configuration, and also the top, uh, condensation of probe in each topological configuration. So this, if you measure this, you can actually directly access to the exponent. So that's something we can do, and we did. So, so, the, so basically, this is still quenched again. So, but uh, we can go up to very high temperature. I didn't, I think this is around TeV or something. It's very high temperature you can get. And, this is the instant on prediction. It seems that the lattice data agrees with the instant on prediction up to very high temperature. Not very surprising, but still fancy, you see. But soon after that, the, the BMW group actually gives the same method and find that the, the instant on estimate, this is blue line, is, uh, and the lattice estimate is actually pretty good agreement. Up to, I mean, there are a factor of 10 difference in the norm normalization, but the, the, the slope seems to be very different. So uh, this is after including quotes. But I would say they are a bit achieving because what they calculate, okay, so we need to calculate uh, the quote condensation for Q equal to one and zero configuration. But what they did is to, okay, calculate that, but somehow subtract the zero mode contribution because that's something which they don't uh, believe, and add instant on contribution. So it's, I would say this is basically instant on cultures. <laughs> so that's why they, are, they have complete uh, agreement. So and anyway, they need to do more uh, study of it. And uh, the more recent result, they, the Japanese group, they chiral very carefully and found that this is basically the idea again as a function of mass in this case. If you plot the, the, if you go mass small, you get the zero value at the finite quark mass. So this is consistent with the Japanese, and the theoretical claim by Japanese group. Actually, the, the, they are same people that are doing this assumption. So, but anyway, so this is still a small lattice, and uh, so it's like 32, so it's not that, but, but anyway, according to them, you know, it is a, a hint or, or evidence of the, the 
U1 axial is actually recovered at the high temperature. So anomaly disappears. Anomaly appears in the equation, but not in the physical world. Is that OK? OK, so let me summarize. So, so that's the <laughs> summary. So, so the, the high T is a fundamental quantity in QCD, and uh, the effective topology is measured by this quantity. And that's very much related to the strong CT problem. And the uh, yeah, Yamil's theory calculation supports the instant picture, but uh, the, with the fermion, dynamical fermions, it, the situation is very you know, controversial now. So uh, more studies may study, I think. Good thing. This is the, I would say, the biggest QCD group. Uh, six flavor. Uh, well, somehow related group. <laughs> Those are Japanese groups. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Iwasaki and uh, I think uh, Nakayama, who claimed that. Uh, yeah, six, uh, is it eight flavor? I think six. Yeah, I forgot. But anyway, yeah. But it's different. Somehow, is there uh, an alternative approach that we could somehow try to use the fact that when theta is non-zero, CP is broken, right? Yes. So you could try to look for, you could work at a non-zero theta and just look for CP breaking. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so is, that, is that an alternative approach? Because I mean, somehow here you're not you're not making use of the fact you're not really benefiting from the fact that theta ah, yes. breaks a symmetry. Well, um, so on the lattice we can't put theta value because we need to, to take a probabilistic interpretation, right? So the action needs to be real number. Well, actually, it's always here, <laughs> but uh, in you, you even in Euclidean imagine. space, yeah. this topological term is actually a phase, right? It's two right. pi, so, so it's, we can't actually put on the lattice. We can actually do that so-called rewaiting. You, you can do the simulation at theta equal to zero and go to theta equal to finite by just a, a, a basically multiplying. Okay, so the action, part of the action can be, so can be thought of as an operator. Right? So that way you can actually simulate the finite theta vacuum by using theta equals zero simulation. That you can do, but you get the obvious result that CP is violated. Okay, maybe we should talk about it later. I don't think I understood that, but uh, we, should, we should talk. Mm -hmm. Multiply by E the I and theta. Yeah. So, so the, we weigh it by a phase. So you, you want to measure theta equal to, say, a, a theta vacuum. That is path integral of the I theta Q. So this is the definition. You can actually put this one later. No, I, I mean, I'm secretly asking because I secretly don't believe that you know how to define this as a topological. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So this is just uh -huh. using that in a different way, right? You yeah. Know, you're using the fact that you claim that you can extract the... Right. right. Yeah, yeah, of course. You know, that's, that's a system. I mean, there's an uncertainty on the, what, how to define the topological search. That's, that's an important question. 
because if you take different definition, you get different results. <laughs> but what's kind of uh, uh, encouraging to me is that uh, these three groups take completely different uh, definitions, but they agreed on, on this physical quantity. So that's, I think, one indication that whatever you, you, your definition is, if you calculate the physical quantity, it should be the same. That's, I think, one indication. So for example, by configuration by configuration, Q can be different if you use different definitions. But if you calculate, for example, the Q squared uh, expectation value, that is this one, that maybe we may say if physics is correct, then I mean, that should be correct. Of course, again, the definition has an issue, but, but uh, that's a one check. Yeah? Any more questions? Let's thank Richard again.